Hey everyone. Traditionally, we do a fifth grade graduation self-portrait lesson. So today I wanna to talk about portraiture, but specifically I wanna talk about the Obama presidential portraits. These were the first presidential portraits done by African-American artists of the first African-American president and first lady. So not only were they exceptional in that way, they were also exceptional in their style and how they were done. If you go to the National Portrait Gallery, you'll see very traditional portraits and then the two Obama portraits. So I want to show those to you and share a little bit about what went into them. So here you can see the unveiling of the official presidential portraits of the Obamas by the artists Kehinde Wiley on the left and Amy Sherald on the right. Amy Sherald paints everyday people doing everyday things. She said, I paint people I want to see in the world, but I want to show what is left out from what you normally see. So she paints exclusively African American subjects. She wants her subjects to become universal and be notable, not for their race, but for their familiarity. Yet you can't get around that she only paints African American subjects. And part of why she does that is because that's a part of art history that we haven't really seen that traditionally hasn't been in the books or in the museums. She chooses to use a gray scale for the skin color exclusively throughout all of her portraits. On one hand, race is very important in her portraits, but on the other hand, she wants to portray the idea of being seen as just someone other than the color of your skin. So that is why she said she's made used a gray scale instead of a traditional black or brown skin color. I'm really trying to correct an art historical narrative. Art history is long, you know, and like the, the first black artist exhibition that wasn't in the basement of the YMCA or something like that wasn't until I think like 1940 something here in Baltimore. I mean, like that's the first one. There's a lot of catching up to do. The experience of receiving the commission to paint the First Lady was life-changing. There's a mystery around her, but then there's also the Michelle Obama that is generously present with all of us, that inspires us, that we can see ourselves in, that um, it's just very relatable. and. Because of that, she's become, in my opinion, a universal archetype. And her image offers young women and young men like a, a new way of seeing themselves. And in my portraits, I also create those kinds of mirrors so that when people come into spaces like that, their expectations of themselves might be changed, but then the expectations of people who have uh, an idea of what they should see in the museum could be shifted as well. When I choose my subjects, I'm looking for something that I really don't have words for, but when I see it, I know that they're exactly the person. I say, hi, my name is Amy. I'm an artist, but like a real artist, like I have work in museums, like literally I say it like that. And then I say, here's my website, and I pull up my phone, and I say, can I get your email? Because if you don't mind, I would like, to use you as a model. For the most part, they say yes. And I've only had one person say no. I'm looking for the same feeling that I got when I was looking at my grandmother's photograph. You know, it's like frozen in time and black and white, and they're so still, and their eyes tell you so much. More than any animated selfie in 2018 could, because I was really thinking about Again, like about that American realism narrative of just painting black people, not in any kind of state of contention or not necessarily didactic, but just being themselves and creating these images that I want to, you know, become universal. So here you can see Amy Sherald's portrait of Michelle Obama. And it's done in her signature style with the grayscale skin color and the bold solid color in the background. The dress is a um, nod to Michelle Obama's fashion sense. She's known for her fashion and it's by a famous designer. But it also 
is a nod to the quilts of Guy's Bend, which are famous African-American quilts done in Guy's Bend in, in Alabama. The women there were known for their quilting using old worn out clothes and leftover shirt sleeves and such in geometric patterns. And it's a big part of quilting and particularly Guy's Bend is a big part of African-American history. So she talks about that. And that was one of the reasons that this dress was chosen. Both the artist and the first lady wanted this portrait to be something for girls and girls of color who normally wouldn't see themselves represented in a great institution like the National Portrait Gallery. So when somebody comes in and sees that, they could see someone that looks like themselves hanging on the wall of this huge museum and say, you know, if opens up a lot of possibilities. It's important to see yourself represented in museums and popular culture and books. And this is a portrait done by the artist Kehinde Wiley, who painted President Obama's portrait. And he likes to take African Americans from popular culture, similar to Amy Sherald, people he sees on the street or just in his daily life. And he asks them if he can paint their portrait. And he puts them in positions of power and in historical paintings, this is a painting of Napoleon. So he's taken that painting and redone it with this person that he met, really changing how he's seen. And he talks a lot about historical context. All those paintings you see, you didn't see, generally African-Americans weren't included in these sorts of paintings of power and prestige from Western art history. So he's taking that and changing that and putting these people that he meets in a position of power. In doing this, he questions the history of Western painting. Why weren't, why are whole groups of people not represented in art history, in the museums, and in the books? When you sit down with Barack Obama and decide and discuss how a painting is going to take form, here, you're dealing literally with the most powerful man in the world. Yeah. So much of my work before was about symbols of power, the performance of power, the illusion and regalia surrounding power. Here's a man who actually has power. That's right. So who's the man? Yeah. And I think that's what that painting's about. That's why uh, the collar loosens. He leans forward to you in, in the painting space. And the source of that power is his connection to the people. Yeah. And so what I'm really doing is painting power. So here's the portrait that Kehinde Wiley did of President Obama. And there's a couple of interesting things here. One, it's totally unlike anything you'll see in the National Portrait Gallery. Usually these are the presidents seated at a desk or standing at a mantle looking powerful and stoic and knowledgeable. Here you see President Obama seated in a, in a formal chair, but he's surrounded by leaves and flowers. He's not in a traditional office or at a desk. There's not any real symbols of power there, except what the artist said, that he is powerful. The flowers here give you a clue about President Obama's history. There's chrysanthemums, jasmine, and African blue daisies, which each symbolize parts of his personal history, that the African daisies represent Kenya, where his father was born. The jasmine represents Hawaii, where President Obama was born and lived, and the chrysanthemums represent Chicago, where he was living when he started his political career and where he started a family. And you can see he looks very casual here. His shirt is unbuttoned. He's directly looking at the viewer. It's a very unique portrait and it involves a lot of the elements that Wiley uses in his other portraits. Through both these portraits of Michelle Obama and Barack Obama, you really get a feeling for the person. Those are essential things of a portrait. You reveal something about that person. So we've looked at Sherald's and Wiley's portraits of the Obamas and there's a couple things I want you to think about as you're doing your own portraits. Think about how they represented the person they were choosing to portray. They included things that spoke about their history, 
or their role or things that they're known for. But they also used their own personal style. They didn't just make a um, photorealistic drawing or painting of the subject. They really included their own signature style. So I'd like you to think about those as you're doing your portraits. And I'd love to see how they come out. Okay, so today we're going to work on drawing a face with the proper proportions. You can start out with just, you know, sort of a head, an egg-shaped head. If you have a mirror handy, you can study and see what your um, general face shape is. I'm kind of an oval, so we'll go with that. And then you need some guidelines. You want to split your head in half and in half this way. So right around there and right around here would be my center lines. So you're going to split it in half left to right and in half bottom and top. There you go. Mine is a tiny bit off, but that's okay for the purposes of this demonstration. Down here, you're now going to split this area in half again, horizontally. So you go like this. These are your guidelines for your general face shape. The eyes will go along here. And the base of the nose will go here. So your ears always go from your eyes down to the base of your nose. If you look in the mirror, you'll see that it's true, even though it doesn't sound right at all. Now the eyes are spaced. It's called the rule of fifths. So right here it needs to be split into five equal parts from the outside of the ear right here. One, so that's about one, two, this is about three, four, five. Okay, so you've got it split up into five. One, two, three, four, five, from ear, outside of the ear to the outside of the ear. You're gonna draw your eyes in, right in here. You don't have to worry too much right now about the shapes of your eyes. This is more for placement, and you can go back and refine the shapes to be the particular shape of your eyes when you're looking in the mirror. Now the nose generally is going to extend. If you extend this down to here and extend this line down to here, that's how wide your nose generally is. And now, again, everybody's different. So you can block in these proportions and then later go back and make it more of your nose. And I'm just going to do a quick kind of sketch nose for the purpose of this demonstration. Okay, so there's there's my nose in there. I'm not even going to do that side. Now you're going to add your irises and your eyes right in the center there. I'm going to put some eyelids in there because it looks weird to me without. And then from the center of the eye, the iris there, you can just extend that line to about there down to this area down here. And that's going to be the outer edges of your lips. Before you draw your lips, down here, from here to the tip of your chin, you want to divide into thirds. So I'm roughly going to do that. And that will be the vertical guidelines for your lips. So this will be the um, top of your lips, and they'll go out to about here. And then the bottom will hit somewhere between, halfway between that next guideline you made. So, make sure you go back when we're done with these guidelines and make them look like your lips. Everywhere there's thin lips and thick lips and all kinds of different shapes. And some people's lips will not be this wide. So, and it also depends on your facial expression. But for now, this is how we get things where we want them.
So now your eyebrows, generally if your eye is about this big, make a mark about that distance, the distance of your eye up above the eye there, and that will be the top of your eyebrow. And the eyebrows extend generally from the corner of the eye out to the other, a little bit past the tip of the eye here. Again, everyone's eyebrows are different and different shapes, different colors, different sizes. So you're gonna make them how you want them. I'm gonna add some pupils here. And then the last thing that's left is um, adding the hair. So you think about your hair, right? it goes a little bit above the actual top of your skull and it comes down to however your hair comes down. I'm gonna add some hair like this for me, something like that. And that is general portrait here. You have to ground your body in something. So here's a neck and some shoulders. So you have your general guidelines here. Now you have to change this to look like you. So here's where your mirror comes in. Really study your face the shapes of your eyes and your nose and your mouth, your hair, all of that, details that make you you. Do you wear glasses? Do you like to wear earrings a lot? I like to wear earrings a lot. I'm gonna put in one of my favorite pairs there. And what, what other details are you gonna add? What is the background gonna be like? We looked at the presidential portraits in two very different backgrounds. One was a really bright color one had a lot of leaves and flowers and stuff, so that's up to you. Maybe something that represents you, or maybe it's just a plain background. Maybe you even cut out your portrait and then paste it on something like a different color piece of paper or a paper that you painted to make it sort of pop out. It's all up to you, and there you have it. So you want to, of course, erase the guidelines as well. But there's your quick tutorial of how to do this. I hope I get to see your portrait.